Awesome. Um, I'm surprised to see people here. The people at the front desk were a little surprised to see me here, so I don't know how to take that. Um, but we'll, we'll kick it off anyway. Um, so thanks heaps for coming along. Um, I do a lot of tech presentations as part of work. So when I come to conferences like this, I like to do something a little bit different. Um, and the last few years, I've been looking at kind of areas outside of tech where I think we can kind of learn from, like so other industries or other areas. And a few years back before all this COVID shenanigans, um, I did a talk on what's called cognitive biases from psychology. And during that talk, I used an example of a plane crash to explain something called fixation bias, where you get so focused on something that you kind of forget everything else. And the feedback I got from that talk was that the people wanted to hear more stories about plane crashes. So here we are, an entire talk about plane crashes. Um, I listened to feedback. So uh, I want to emphasize though today, that today my goal isn't to make you scared of flying. It, it isn't to scare you, it's quite the opposite. Um, commercial air travel is incredibly safe. And I think that there's a whole lot that we can learn from them and the lessons that they've learned over the years. Um, but a bit of a warning, I am going to be sharing real stories of real plane crashes that are pretty close to home. Um, so if you are a nervous flyer, this may not be the talk for you. Um, otherwise, we'll kick on. So I want to start with the story of United Airlines Flight 173. So this was a cross-country flight from New York to Portland with a stopover in Denver. And on the 28th of December 1978, the plane operating the flight shown here was a 1960s era McDonnell Douglas DC-8. Um, so that's a four-engine, narrow-body aircraft uh, capable of carrying more than 250 passengers. For the evening leg from Portland to Denver, or from Denver to Portland, sorry, it's uh, 179 passengers and 10 crew boarded the plane. The pilot in command was Captain McBroom, uh, one of United's most experienced captains, along with the much, much less experienced flight uh, first officer and a flight engineer named Forrest Mendenhall. The flight proceeded normally until final approach into Portland, just after 5 p.m. local time. Coming in from the, the southeast, uh, the crew ran through the approach checklist, which included lowering the landing gear. Um, but there was a problem. Part of the mechanism that retracts the right landing gear was corroded. And when the crew lowered the gear, uh, the corroded part kind of broke away, allowing the gear to drop into place. That shook the whole plane. And um, in the cockpit, the light that should show that the landing gear was down and locked failed to illuminate. That was because the, the force of the, the landing gear dropping had actually cut the circuit to the indicator light. Um, but despite this, the, the, light or the, the landing gear was actually down and locked, but the crew had no way of really knowing this. So the captain advised air traffic control uh, that they had a problem with their landing gear and needed to hold until it was resolved. The controller directed them into a holding pattern, basically flying a loop or bog laps just away from the airport um, to give them some time to, to fix the issue. To confirm if the gear was down, the flight engineer went back into the cabin with the flashlight to check if there was a little rod which kind of popped up on the wing when the landing gear is down and locked on this type of aircraft. Um, so looking through a passenger's window, I'd imagine that passenger was like, yeah. what the hell? Um, with, with a flashlight, um, he, he thought he could see the rod but couldn't 100% tell whether or not it was there. So this kind of re only reinforced the, the captain's kind of concern that the right landing gear wasn't down and wasn't locked and that it might collapse on landing. So they ran some more checks, but they were inconclusive. About 30 minutes into the holding pattern, um, he called up the lead flight attendant and asked them to prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. At 5.47, so about 47 minutes into the holding pattern, the first officer asked the flight engineer, how much fuel do we have left? And Mendenhall replied, 5,000 pounds. So that's nothing for an aircraft. And it should have been a clear sign to the captain that they needed to get out of this holding pattern and get onto the ground as quickly as possible. Um, but the captain didn't seem to take the hint, and he said, oh, I reckon another 15 minutes. Um, apparently still trying to look for that one little test that would tell him with 100% certainty that the landing gear was down and locked. And the flight engineer wasn't happy with this, not surprisingly, and basically said, not enough. 15 minutes is going to run us real low on fuel here. Basically trying to tell Captain McBroom that they were running out of fuel without actually telling him they were running out of fuel. At 5.54, coming up on another circuit on that loop, um, the uh, Captain McBroom sent Mendenhall back into the cabin to check whether the passengers and crew were ready for the emergency landing. 
So this was right about the time where he should have been leaving the loop and going in to, to land. Um, but seeming kind of oblivious to what was going on, he started another loop. At 6.06 p.m., um, so an hour and six minutes into the, into the holding pattern, with the plane still now at this point heading away from the airport, um, the flight attendant came into the cabin and informed the, the, uh, the pilots that they were ready, the cabin was ready. Um, McBroom finally acknowledged that they were ready to land and um, turned back towards the airport. At that exact moment, the number four engine started rolling back as its fuel tank ran dry. The first officer said, we are going to lose an engine. McBroom asked why, and the first officer replied, fuel, in what I imagine was a quite sarcastic tone. Um, the, they rushed to open the crossfeed valves, so these are valves that will let fuel flow from engines that don't have anything in it to ones that do. Um, but this proved to be pretty useless as all of the, the fuel tanks were running dry at that point. Um, number four, at that point, number four engine flamed out, followed moments later by number three. So those are the two outer ones on the wings. Um, 19 kilometers short of the runway, engines one and two ran out of fuel and they both flamed out as well. With less than about two minutes before the plane would hit the ground, the crew had to find some place to land in a, a very kind of heavily forested suburb. They thought they spotted a dark spot ahead and aimed towards it as best they could. Unfortunately, what they were looking at wasn't a field. It was a section of neighborhood where several houses just happened not to have any lights on. The DC-8 just barely avoided a multi-story apartment tower. Um, the plane plowed through trees before the left wing struck a house, ripping the wing off and leveling the building. The rest of the plane slid across the street, bringing down power lines before striking another house and demolishing it. The cockpit and first class uh, disintegrated, while the rest of the fuselage came to a halt. At the front of the airplane, the lead flight attendant was dead, along with uh, the flight engineer Mendenhall and eight passengers. But Captain McBroom survived, uh, along with the first officer, and 171 passengers, who at this point were now making their way out of the, the fuselage, um, very confused, into, into the surrounding suburb. Incredibly though, despite the fact that the plane had totally destroyed two houses, both were unoccupied and nobody on the ground was hurt. Once the dust cleared though, the industry faced a, a hard question. How had an experienced crew flying a, a perfectly serviceable airplane run out of fuel and crashed, killing 10 people? And the answer would really kind of change aviation forever. The National Transportation Safety board, uh, NTSB, in the US, uh, investigate all crashes in the US. They found that the, the crew, especially Captain McBroom, had lost his sense of the passage of time and any sense of how much fuel they had on board. Um, the hints from the co-pilots that they were running low um, were automatically tuned out. And the first officer and the flight engineer really failed to assert themselves and in, instead kept waiting for McBroom to kind of realize what they were, what they were hinting at and see the writing on the wall. That showed that their respect for McBroom's authority was, was really getting in the way of safe flight, especially for Mendenhall, who was keenly aware of the situation, but kept doing whatever McBroom told him to do, like going back into the cabin, even though he knew they were running out of fuel. In its final report uh, on the crash of Flight 173, the N NTSB forcefully recommended the introduction of what's now called Crew Resource Management, or CRM, so yay, another CRM, uh, into every airline cockpit. CRM training, though, would specifically teach captains to, number one, delegate responsibilities effectively, ensuring that you know, someone was always flying the plane and that people weren't overloaded with responsibilities. And number two, to communicate clearly and directly, asking fellow crew members for input. It would also teach first and second officers to speak up when concerned, um, even introducing things like formulaic openers to use when they felt there was a problem so they could bring it to the captain. Um, and they'd also be taught that sometimes the captain doesn't always know better and that when the safety of the flight is on the line that they should actually just take over. Um, United Airlines was the first to adopt CRM training and all other major US airlines followed quite quickly after. Today, CRM is used in every airline around the world um, and even in other high stakes professions like emergency medical care and firefighting. Its impact in saved lives is incalculable. Um, in fact, it's widely regarded as the single um, most significant factor in the dramatic improvement of uh, aviation safety in the last 50 years. Based on passenger deaths per kilometre, 
Um, flying in 2021 was about 32 times safer than it was in 1970. And because pilot error is the, the single largest uh, cause of accidents, and much of that improvement can be credited to CRM. For, for most of us in IT, we aren't working on critical systems like this, where lives are on the line. Um, but there is a lot that I think we can learn from career resource management. Understanding how you can communicate as a team and how you communicate with other teams, I think, is one of the most important factors of the success of most projects. And I think that most of us would agree that the way a lot of companies organize and manage technical teams can be a little disappointing at times. When I first started out, I, I assumed there'd be kind of structured processes and, and patterns like we'd learned about at university. Um, and it was a little bit shocking to, to kind of realize that managers were, were basically just winging it most of the time and uh, you know, didn't really know what they were doing. And I think a, a lack of a structured process is why we've seen things um, like people copying the Spotify model, which is a personal pet peeve, um, and monstrosities like SAFE, you know, the scaled agile framework. I think we, we're kind of longing for that one true way of doing things. Um, but yeah. Um, so what I think a lot of companies now though are starting to realize uh, is that you can't just copy and paste organizational design. Um, there are too many variables involved. And for us, it's a little bit more complicated than the organizational design within a cockpit. So I've been really excited with the, the momentum that's kind of growing around this in the last few years. Um, and I think there's a few resources that can really help to, to get you started looking at this. Um, team topologies uh, really brought together a lot of the concepts that, that have been gaining traction and combined it with some real practical kind of advice. It proposes things like we restrict team responsibilities to match the, the, the cognitive load, so similar to, to what I talked about in CRM, so that we don't overburden the team with more kind of tasks than they can take on collectively. Um, it also details topologies or structures for your teams uh, for, for a specific kind of situational context within your organization. Wardley mapping is a technique uh, to help visually map your strategy. This was created by Simon Wardley. Um, and you can use it to collectively design and communicate where you're going, like pilots do at maps. They're a very, very important thing for them. Um, most airlines have rules around pairing less experienced people together. And I think uh, dynamic reteaming is something that we can use to, to do something similar. Um, it helps us to build kind of learning organizations and nurture and develop people within teams. And all of these new approaches combine extremely well with concepts like domain-driven design. Um, and I really feel like with the combination of these, we're starting to develop the tools necessary to, to design modern kind of technology teams purposely and effectively, um, and coming close to defining our own kind of version of crew resource management. Um, so Suzanne Kaiser beat me to the punch and uh, put together a great talk on this, combining all these things. Uh, she did this one at DDD France. It's available on YouTube if you want to have a watch. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and those books as well. If you haven't read those, uh, they are great. Going back to, to Captain McBroom, though. So all of the mistakes that he made were kind of symptomatic of a, a deeper underlying problem in the aviation industry. It wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Um, he still took the, the fall for the crash and was forced to retire immediately afterwards. Um, he actually lost his pilot's license and never flew again. And McBroom himself seemed to waver between kind of blaming himself and blaming the system. Um, he although he, you know, he clearly kind of thought both were at fault. Um, most people in the industry, though, kind of only really felt pity for him. They didn't feel angry. Um, he'd fallen prey to something that any of us really could. And the attitude towards apportioning blame has changed in the airline industry since it's matured, or as it's matured since the 70s, um, which we will see in my next example. So on the 1st of June uh, 2009, this aircraft, uh, an Airbus A330, flying as Air France Flight 447, if you remember that one, um, took off from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. It proceeded normally for about three and a half hours, by which point it entered a radar dead zone in the middle of the Atlantic, where neither the controllers in Brazil or the controllers in Senegal over on the other side of the Atlantic um, could see the plane on their screens. At about 1.55 a.m. UTC, uh, Captain Marc Dubois traded places with the relief co-pilot, um, David Robert. Um, Robert flew alongside co-pilot uh, Pierre Cedric Bonin for another 15 minutes before things started to go wrong. A large thunderstorm appeared in the plane's flight path, and the pilots decided to fly through it um, because they couldn't climb high enough to go over the top of it. Now, normally, pilots will, will try and fly around thunderstorms, and why they didn't is, is still unknown to this day. 
Um, although it was likely to, to put the, the plane in any serious danger, the thunderstorm did cause one minor issue. Ice crystals formed in a part of the plane called the pitted tubes. So pitted tubes are on the uh, tiny little tubes on the outside of the aircraft that measure airspeed as it rushes into them. Um, but because they were blocked, it began feeding incorrect information into the autopilot. This then switched the autopilot into a state, or the flight controls into a state that's called alternate law. So in alternate law, the autopilot functions that rely on that airspeed um, turn off. And that also uh, turned off the anti-stall capability. So stalls are what happens when there's not enough kind of airflow going over the wing of, of an airplane, so it can't produce enough lift. And it's typically kind of caused what's called a high angle of attack, where the, the plane is kind of pointing up kind of too high. Um, the pilots, though, had been briefed on what to do if the pitted tubes uh, became blocked. The, the normal procedure was just to keep the aircraft level until it unblocked, and it would usually just take a couple of minutes. Um, but as the autopilot disconnect warning sounded, the pilots didn't take those steps. Um, and what followed was a like, really a complete breakdown of crew resource management. Um, first Officer Bonin announced that, that he had control, but instead of holding the plane steady, he started pa panicked and really started to pull back on the control stick. That sent the plane into a climb of over 7,000 feet per minute. Now, a variety of things might have contributed to why, why he did this. Um, the pilots had been kind of startled by the sudden disconnect of the autopilot, and they dealt with it poorly. Um, they actually had no training in flying the airplane manually at high altitudes. For most of the time, it was all on autopilot. Um, and they'd lost trust in their airspeed reading. So even when they returned to normal a few minutes later, they still didn't trust them. After climbing about 2,000 feet, the, the plane's airspeed dropped precipitously and a stall warning started to blare in the cockpit. First officer, Robert, tried to tell Bonin that they needed to go down and Bonin agreed um, that they needed to, set, to descend, but nevertheless kind of kept pulling back on, on the st side stick. At this point, he'd raised the nose up to 16 degrees. Um, the plane, uh, one, or sorry, one minute after the control switched, um, the aircraft stalled fully and started to, to fall from the sky. It fell pretty much straight down. Now, at this point, with a, a nose high attitude of over 40 degrees, so kind of about there. Um, the corrective course of action should have been obvious to the pilots. It's something they're, they're trained from the very, very start, and that's to, to point the nose down, gain speed, and basically fly out of the stall. Um, but neither officer seemed to, to have any idea about what was happening, and they were completely overwhelmed with, with the emergency. Um, Bonin, in particular, seemed to revert to that very primal instinct that people have, that when you're falling down, you pull the stick to pull the nose up to go up. Um, Robert, meanwhile, didn't really know what Bonin was doing, and Bonin never told him. Um, to make matters worse, both pilots probably thought that they couldn't stall the plane. And if they'd been in normal law, that would have been true. But because things had switched into this alternate law, um, the plane and the automation couldn't actually prevent the stall. So Captain Dubois returned to find the cockpit in chaos and he asked what was happening. And Robert responded that we've totally lost control of the plane. We don't understand it at all. We've tried everything. The plane though, was now falling at about 10,000 feet per minute at an altitude or from an altitude of 35,000 feet. The nose was now pointed so high that the computer considered the airspeed measurements to be completely invalid. Um, the stall warnings and the stall warning stopped because of this. This possibly kind of convinced Bonin that by pulling back on the stick, he was actually helping things um, and improving the situation. The pilots continued to discuss what to do for a couple of minutes, um, but nobody noticed the fact that they were actually in a stall. Finally, as the plane dropped through about 10,000 feet, that's about 3,000 meters, just for reference, um, Robert said, climb, climb, climb. And Bonin responded saying, but I've had the stick back the whole time. Finally, the, the crew and the captain understood why the plane was falling from the sky. First Officer Robert immediately took over controls without telling Bonin and tried to point the nose of the plane down to gain speed, but they were very, very quickly running out of altitude. Bonin panicked again and retook control again without telling Robert and started to pull back in the stick again. With Bonin and Robert making kind of uh, uh, opposite control inputs, the, the plane averaged the two and continued to fall at pretty much a uh, um, horizontal position. As the plane hurtled towards the ocean, uh, the last words of the pilots were captured on the cockpit voice reporter. Robert exclaimed, damn it, we're going to crash, this can't be happening. Bonin asked, but what's happening? Dubois answered, 10 degrees of pitch. A split second later, flight 447 slammed tail first into the Atlantic Ocean, obliterating the aircraft and killing all 228 passengers and crew.
Because the plane went in without a distress call in an area of the ocean not covered by radar, um, it wasn't until almost two hours later before anybody noticed that 447 was missing. For over 24 hours, it seemed like the, the plane had vanished without a trace until the Brazilian Air Force um, spotted an oil slick and light wreckage the following day. Finally, on the 3rd of June, um, recovery ships reached the areas, uh, area and discovered uh, floating bodies, personal effects, and the plane's vertical stair but stabilizer um, seen here. But most of the wreckage actually lay far beneath the Atlantic Ocean at a depth of over 3,000 meters, and finding it would be a huge, huge challenge. For two whole years, nobody actually knew what had happened to Flight 447. And after three long and fruitless searches in three different areas, the team finally located the wreckage in April 2011. The flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder um, were recovered from the wreckage in May, and 104 bodies were also brought to the service, but 74 were never found. 50 had been recovered previously. Um, when investigators in France successfully downloaded the information from the recorders, what they found was really almost kind of inconceivable, that three experienced pilots flew a modern passenger plane in absolutely perfect condition into the sea. And it would be easy to blame Bonin, and some do, um, but Flight 447 didn't crash simply because he pulled back on the control stick, but rather because of a, a convergence of kind of small failures and deep psychological kind of implications for the pilots. First, um, all three pilots may have been fatigued. Captain Dubois was heard on the cockpit voice recorder saying that he only got one hour of sleep beforehand. Um, second, the pilots weren't sufficiently trained in hand flying the aircraft at high altitude, at cruise altitude. And third, and most critically, um, the plane's automation, which was meant to help make flying easier, gave the pilots an inconsistent and confusing information. So changes have been made, um, you'll, you'll probably be glad to hear, to reduce the likelihood of an accident like this happening again. Um, the pitot tubes on all Airbus A330s and A340s were replaced with a model that wouldn't ice up uh, um, uh, and give inaccurate speeds um, like this. This was actually before anyone had knew what had happened to 447, so after it had crashed, but before it had been found. Um, crews are also now trained to, to better handle unreliable airspeed indicators and high altitude sols, something that they hadn't been trained in before. So today, kind of any pilots faced with the same situation will immediately remember the mistakes of crew, the crew of Flight 447. So what I'd really like to, to highlight here that we can learn from is the, that the goal of the investigation um, that, they, that was made into 447, it wasn't to apportion blame. Um, it was to discover what went wrong and how safety could be improved to ensure that it never happened again. Um, while Bonham was the, the prominent actor in the story, you know, he was a relatively good pilot, um, put in just a surprising situation that he hadn't been trained for. Um, he certainly didn't go to work that morning intending to crash the plane and kill himself you know, and 226 other people. And we're starting to see this kind of thinking uh, become a, a bit more mainstream in our industry too. Um, Google's SRE team have a great write-up in their book on blameless postmortems um, and the inspiration that they actually took from the aviation industry to, to construct this. And for them, I'm quote, quoting here, um, a blamelessly written postmortem assumes that everyone involved in an incident had good intentions and did, a, did the right thing with the information they had. If a culture of finger pointing and shaming individuals or teams for doing the wrong thing prevails, people will not bring issues to light for fear of punishment. End quote. Um, so the recommendations made after the crash of Flight 447 highlight another area of interest for us. The automation was a contributing factor in the crash, and the changes made um, included more training for pilots to be able to handle situations where automation fails. So automation is obviously a huge factor for, for um, airline safety, and it's becoming the same for IT. If you've read Accelerate, um, or their, their State of the DevOps report, State of DevOps report that's published every year, you'll know that huge advantages that automation is giving to high-performing teams. Um, but it's important that the people who are understand, or people who are using your platforms or using this automation understand the failure points of that automation and how to handle those situations. Teams apologies that, that I kind of mentioned earlier on um, has some really good insights into how to structure platform teams to support this um, if you're not a Google or Netflix size organization. And one of the things I was kind of super stoked to see in the, all, most of the recent DevOps reports um, was the inclusion of psychological safety as a factor in affecting high-performing teams. Um, in the airline industry, this falls under what's known as human factors. So human factors is kind of the application of things like psychology and anthropology um, to the design and operation of, of products and systems. 
Um, the purpose is to, to attempt to kind of reduce the likelihood of, of negative outcomes by, by understanding how people and groups of people actually work. Um, this layperson's introduction um, to our to, to human factors training is published by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. It's available on the web. Um, and it's a great short history of the field and includes great references to jump off into detail of the subject. So uh, the understanding, uh, understanding how people think um, and react to things is useful, but to, to kind of understand why people act the way they do, you need to understand the nature of the, the systems that they operate in. And to do that, you really need to understand the culture which we'll talk about in my next example. So on the morning of the 29th of October, 2018, Lion Air Flight 610, operated by a Boeing 737 MAX 8, and pushed back from the gate at Socarno Hatta International Airport in Jakarta. Um, Captain Bahave Suneja was in command of the aircraft, along with First Officer Harveno. Um, both pilots had more than 5,000 hours of experience on the Boeing 737 aircraft. At 6.20 a.m. local time, Flight 610 began its takeoff roll. Even before the plane had left the runway, they received the first signal that something was wrong. The control column started shaking and loudly, warning them that the plane was in danger of stalling and could crash. This is while they were still on the ground. The captain decided to continue the takeoff procedure and um, started to climb. Two critical sensors had registered different readings between the pilot and first officer instruments, um, indicating two different values for the plane's airspeed and its altitude. This confused both pilots. Two minutes into the flight, while still attempting to climb, the plane suddenly dropped over 700 feet, um, furthering the pilot's confusion. The aircraft's automation had basically forced the plane's nose down. The pilots recovered from the drop, um, but noted to air traffic control that they were having a flight control problem and requested to return to the airport. As they continued to climb to a safer altitude um, over the next 10 minutes, this pattern repeated itself with the plane's automatic systems pointing the nose down and Captain Sneja using what are called the electronic trim, um, trim buttons on the, on the uh, control column to correct it. Um, this basically kind of uh, caused it to, to almost dolphin. In the space of one minute, uh, the captain had to correct this more than five times. So fighting against a system that he didn't understand, Captain Sneja repeatedly asked the first officer for checklists to handle unreliable airspeeds. As he continuously corrected the plane's uh, attitude, Harvino looked through the manuals and checklists trying to find a solution to the problem, but to no avail. At 6.30 a.m., the captain handed control of Flight 610 over to the first officer for reasons that are unclear. Instead of using the electric trim buttons to counteract the system, the, the first officer tried to fight manually, pulling back on the control column with everything that he could. At 6.32, the first officer told Captain Sineja twice that the plane was flying down. The captain responded to the second attempt, it's okay. The plane plunged 5,000 feet at nearly 700 kilometers per hour straight into the Java Sea, killing all 189 people on board. Um, it had been just over 12 minutes from takeoff to the point of impact. Indonesia's National Search and Rescue Agency immediately launched an operation mobilizing thousands of people um, to recover the aircraft and the bodies of the passengers and crew. Even though the crash site was in a, a shallow part of the ocean, the violence of the impact made recovery very, very difficult. And the plane's flight data recorder was recovered on the 1st of November, but the cockpit voice recorder was not found until January the following year. It had been buried under eight meters of sand. It had hit so hard. On the 23rd of November, investigators concluded the victim identification process. Of the 189 people on board, 125 were identified, and 64 bodies are still unaccounted for. When the MAX 8 revision um, to the enormously popular 737 series, which we've all flown on, um, was imagined, Boeing was facing a competitive challenge from their only rival, Airbus. The new Airbus A320neo used new larger engines that reduced fuel consumption and promised significant savings in operational costs. Um, that's the A320 on the, the left-hand side of the diagram there. Originally, it was kind of considered impossible because um, to, or, it considered impossible to put larger wing, engines on the 737, and because the wings on the 737 are lower on the, the right-hand side there, so the larger engines would have actually, the red dotted line would have been close to the ground. But faced with a competitor who was pulling away and the cost of designing a new airframe being prohibitively expensive for, for Boeing to do, they found another way. Um, 
what they did was they moved the engines forward and up on the wing to allow them to, to accommodate the new larger engines. This resulted in a plane that was um, so nearly identical to existing 737s that, that pilots on current models could fly it without requiring expensive retraining, just like the A320 NEO. But by moving the engines up and forward on the wing, Boeing had changed the dynamics of flight slightly, um, increasing the tendency of the plane to, to climb too steeply and induce a stall. So since the value proposition to airlines mandated no new training, they decided that an automated solution was required. And Boeing quietly introduced the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. In certain situations, MCAS would activate using stabilizer trim to correct the angle of attack and bring it back in line. Unfortunately, where the, the sensor failed, the system would erroneously follow the same procedure, pushing the nose down to disastrous effect. On the 10th of March 2019, five months after the crash of Lion Air, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, another Boeing 737 MAX 8, crashed shortly after takeoff from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, killing all 157 people on board. The final report for the crash investigation of Ethiopian Airlines has still not been released nearly two and a half years later, um, but from an interim report, the MCAS system was implicated once again, and Boeing have since admitted fault for the accident. Shortly thereafter, the entire global fleet of 737 MAX aircraft was grounded pending an investigation, and while they've, they've since returned to service, they are still grounded in some parts of the world. For Lion Air Flight 610, the final report was pretty damning. Um, first, it found that the, the aircraft should have been grounded before departing on the fatal flight because of an earlier cockpit issue. The day before the crash, another flight crew on the same aircraft had, had the exact same system malfunction on a flight from Denpasar into Jakarta. Um, with the help of a third line air pilot who just happened to be, to be um, on the flight and in the cockpit, the crew deactivated the MCAS system and flew the plane manually to its destination. Um, but no entry had been made in the maintenance log about the issue. Um, the pilots on 610 didn't even know that there, there were any major problems on the previous flight. Further, they, the report found that the first officer had performed poorly in training and had struggled to remember a list of procedures that he should have had memorised. He was flying the plane um, just before it went into that fatal dive, um, but the report said that the, the captain hadn't briefed him properly, properly before handing over the controls to him. So there's a lot of kind of what-ifs here. Um, if the, the crew of the previous flight had given a um, more detailed description of the problem, the aircraft might you know, never taken off that day on the, on the fatal flight. And if the captain, who up until that point had success, successfully kind of kept the flight in the air, um, if he hadn't handed over to his less capable first officer, again, the disaster might have been avoided. And there's certainly kind of questions around the safety culture of Lion Air. Um, but most of the blame in the report um, was centred on Boeing and the US Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA. Um, it pinpointed the design and certification of the 737 MAX 8 as the primary root of the problem. Investigators uh, listed the design of the MCAS system itself as a contributing factor because it relied on information from a single external sensor, um, making it vulnerable to, obviously, to erroneous input from that sensor. They found that Boeing was able to design and test its own system without prior oversight or a thorough safety assessment from the FAA. Um, the Boeing engineers never expected that MCAS would fail um, continuously and repeatedly and never even seriously considered it as a possibility. When they were designing the system, they concluded that a repeated failure of, the, of MCAS was no more problematic than a one-time failure because they assumed that the pilots would simply apply the opposite trim input and counteract the MCAS. They also assumed that pilots would immediately recognize the problem and override the system with manual flight controls. Um, and that doing so would, and I quote here, um, not require exceptional piloting skills or strength. However, near the end of the, the Lion Air flight, the first officer was pulling back on the control column with over 50 kilograms of force, basically nearly his entire body weight, but he was unable to keep the plane from diving into the ground. The report also found that flight crews lacked key information about the MCAS system. They didn't even know it existed, um, since none of it was included in the training manuals or the aircraft manuals. When Boeing originally um, started marketing the 737 MAX 8, it was a brilliant success. Um, they overtook Airbus in the segment with 737 MAX orders rising 300% in 2012 and Airbus A320 NEO orders dropping 
and but internal communications handed over to the US congressional investigators in January 2020 exposed a collapse in engineering culture and morale during the design of the 737 MAX 8. Employees who were developing the computer-based training, training for the 737 MAX suggested providing more guidance in the pilot manual on how to handle certain emergencies and raised concerns that the skills assumed were not very, um, not very intuitive for younger pilots or for those who had become accustomed and too reliant on automation. They were told that that's probably true, um, but it's the box that we're painted into and what they were being pressured to do. In short, um, Boeing's culture driven by market forces and competition had foregone safety. In the words of Stan Sorcher, uh, a former Boeing engineer, priorities had shifted over the last two decades with profit mattering more than quality. So culture uh, is a little bit of an overused and abused phrase in, in business. A lot of the times we hear tech organizations talking about their culture, they're talking about things a bit like, you know, we've got pizza and beer on a Friday night, or we've got an Xbox in the lunchroom. Um, but that's not culture. Culture is the way that a company does things and really what's important to them. And for us in tech, I think a, a failure in culture can come in, in kind of many different ways. If, if you're a product company, it might be that, you know, you, you fail to build what the customer actually wants because you, you start focusing on the most profitable features or trying to keep your, your existing market share. Steve Jobs did, it, did an interview on this, it's available on YouTube, um, uh, on why this happened at Xerox and how the, the shift from leadership being from product people um, into marketing people being as leaders uh, caused one of the most innovative early IT companies to fail. Puts it way more succinctly and better than I could. Um, for, for most IT orgs, um, be they kind of internal or external, though a failure of culture might be because you're, you're dropping quality to meet deadlines, like we saw at Boeing there. Um, and I saw that this study linked on a thread on Twitter last week um, that reflects something I've seen. I haven't had a chance to, to fully dig into it, but the, the paper was written by Margaret Ann Story from the University of Victoria with contribution from Microsoft and Microsoft Research. And looked at, um, as the title says, how developers and managers define and trade productivity for quality. And um, the crux of what they found was, was interesting that, that developers think their managers just care about outputs um, as opposed to kind of quality and outcome. Um, and they think that managers would sacrifice quality for output. Um, whereas managers, and you can be a bit sarcastic and say that they say, but managers say that they actually care about quality and outcomes. So it seems like um, managers and developers have, well, number one, they've got different definitions of what productivity is. Um, and that makes measuring productivity effectively impossible for us. Um, and without like a common definition, it's even harder to, to agree like what changes to make to a team's process and workflows. Where I've seen this in action uh, is in hearing tech people talk about the business. Any of you come across that before? You've heard it? Um, and usually it's in the context of, oh, no, 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 the business wouldn't go for that, you know? Um, and more often than not, when I've dug into it and I've asked them, like, who is the business? Who's the person we need to talk to to get approval for this? They can't tell me. So, like, it's not a person. It's not a department. It's just this kind of imagined entity demanding or denying things, you know? And my answer to people, or my question almost to people like that, is to, to kind of compare it to people who say, I'm stuck in a traffic jam. Um, you're not in traffic, you are traffic. And you're not delivering to the business, you are the business, you know? So act like it and make a decision and don't defer to some imagined business. Anyway, it's like random soapbox over. Um, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no, I've completely lost where I am. Uh, no, no, you're okay. I'll just take the applause. Um, so. The thing is, though, in terms of culture, there are no quick fixes to a failing culture. And the only thing I, I can really kind of suggest is um, if you have the will to go, um, to keep going is to, you know, rage. Rage against the dying of the light to try and keep that culture. To learn more about building great cultures um, and companies, I'd highly recommend Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, there's heaps of books out there about culture. This one talks about the kind of underlying variables of what it is that actually makes a great company. And it backs it up with real data as opposed to the kind of survivorship bias you see in the, some of the other kind of great culture books, which is, yeah, it was great for Spotify in 1997 in a small suburb in Sweden. Um, 
Collins also talks about building a culture of discipline, which I, I think is a better generic term for it. Um, I've used the, the, a kind of a culture of quality before, but as we've seen, quality is a bit of a, a fluffy term. Um, I think discipline kind of captures better um, as a concept, um, be that like a discipline of safety or uh, like a, a discipline of engineering quality. And if you work in a bureaucratic organization um, where any kind of cultural change is unimaginable, um, have a read of The Delicate Art of Bureaucracy for some ideas. It was recommended to me last year. It is a, a great read and um, not as dry as you think for a book about bureaucracy. So um, for Boeing, their change of culture had disastrous effects, um, not only in lives, but also as a business. They lost 80 billion in fines and canceled orders, and it remains to be seen how they'll come out of this crisis, especially after COVID-19. Um, Netflix have released a documentary on Boeing called Downfall, and it's well worth a watch if you'd like to learn more. Um, it is pretty shocking, some of, some of the stuff that went on there. But the airline industry in general is built on a culture of safety, and they, there's no way that they could do what they do at the scale that they do without it. And one of the key mechanisms that they, they use to achieve this is actually understanding risk. So every component on an aircraft has a well-understood failure rate and appropriate maintenance or replacement rates to ensure that they don't get to that point. For this last example, um, I want to talk about something a little bit closer to home, um, both geographically and professionally, to highlight why understanding risk is important. Yes, Qantas. Um, so Qantas Flight 72 was, and still is, a regularly scheduled service between Singapore and Perth, Western Australia, where I live, um, and I've been on this. Um, did someone just woo that? Yeah. <laughs> woo! Cool. Um, on the 7th of October, 2008, it was operated by a wide-body Airbus A330 again. A330s are very safe, though. I've just realized there's two of them in here. Um, the flight left Singapore at 9.32 local time with 303 passengers and 12 crew aboard, heading south across the Indian Ocean. In command of the flight was Captain Kevin Sullivan and First Officer Peter Lipset, um, both of whom had more than 10,000 hours flying. A third pilot, Second Officer Ross Hales, was also flying along so that the pilots could alternate rest breaks during the flight. About halfway through the journey, um, the first officer lifts it, uh, gave up his seat to, to, uh, to hail um, to go on its rest break. It was 12.39 p.m. Deep in the A330's avionics bay, a fault appeared in a device called the Air Data Inertial Reference Unit, or ADIRU-1 for short. Um, I'm just going to refer to it as IRU because ADIRU is very hard to say hard, uh, to say multiple times. Um, the A330 has three IRUs, each of which is connected to an independent set of sensors, and, and they measure a wide range of parameters from things like the, the airspeed, um, the altitude, the, and the angle of attack. So that's the kind of the measure of the pitch angle of the plane relative to the airflow, so that kind of angle there. The IRUs that process, uh, are, they process that information and they feed it into the flight computers. Um, and they do this in the form of 32-bit words um, encoded in binary. Some of you may already know what's coming on this one. Um, so a word from the IRU uh, sent to the flight computer contains an 8-bit label that signifies what type of information is being conveyed. So that might be um, airspeed, altitude, or angle of attack. It also has a 2-bit source destination identifier, up to 19 bits of actual kind of measured data, and a 2-bit status indicator that signifies whether it's valid or invalid, and also a 1-bit parity indicator as well. It's great that I don't have to explain this to you. Would have taken too much time. Um, of particular interest to us, though, is that 19-bit data section. So each bit in the 19-bit sequence is assigned a particular number, because, uh, and that number is always twice the preceding number. Um, and that changes based on the kind of parameter, so what it, what it actually gets mapped to back in it. Um, and a value is encoded as the sum of those numbers. So for example, for Flight 72's cruising altitude of 37,012 feet, um, which is on the, the right-hand side of the, the red box there. Hopefully you can read it from the back. Um, that's indicated by a binary value of 1 on bits 27, 24, 19, and 15, um, with all the other bits set to 0. So what exactly happened inside the IRU-1 on Flight 72 at precisely 1240 is still unknown to this day. 
But as soon as the error occurred, um, the IRU started to send out bursts of mislabeled data where altitude information was mislabeled as angle of attack information. Um, because the exact value of the data encoded in the words um, depends on what type of data is labeled as, that information obviously became corrupted. So if we take that previous example of 37,012 feet, um, on the scale used for angle of attack data, which is in the red box on the left-hand side there, those exact same bits correspond to the values summing to a total of 50.625 degrees. So basically what the data is saying here is that the plane is pointing like this, as opposed to what it actually is pointing like this. So the built-in error correction um, that labeled the data as valid or invalid didn't catch the problem because the corruption occurred during the word assembly process after the checks had been performed. In the cockpit though, the pilots noticed the bad effects of the data within seconds of its creation. First, the autopilot disconnected as it was unable to reconcile the difference between the three IRUs. Um, Captain Sullivan immediately announced that he had manual control. Um, less than five seconds later, the pilots found themselves bombarded by a sudden cascade of warnings. Um, fault messages flooded onto the computer screen in the central console, and the stall and overspeed warnings both started going off intermittently. Now, this is pretty much impossible because a stall means you're going too slow, and an overspeed means you're going too fast. So, Captain Sullivan tried to engage the A330's second backup autopilot, and at the same time, <coughs> The airspeed and altitude values on his flight display, which are sourced from IRU-1, just went haywire, fluctuating completely wildly compared to the, you know, just the plane cruising along. In response to the unreliable airspeed indication, Sullivan switched off the autopilot and flew the plane manually um, using the standby instruments on the co-pilot side. Um, utterly baffled by the cascade of warnings, Captain Sullivan and Second Officer Hales called First Officer Lipset back to the cockpit to try and help figure out what was going on. But before Lipsa could make it back, um, what had just been happening in the computer up until now suddenly broke through into the real world. A spike of um, altitude data, which had been mislabeled as angle of attack data and marked as valid by the flight computer, um, triggered the plane's automated protections. So these protections normally prevent pilots from making control inputs that could put the plane into danger. Um, but in this case, it applied a sudden 10 degree nose down elevator movement. Um, the effect of this command while in cruise flight was sudden and catastrophic the plane entered an immediate dive. In the cockpit, the pilots were pulled up and out of their seats, restrained only by their lap belts. Um, but in the back, at least 60 passengers weren't wearing their, um, weren't wearing their seat belts. And the negative G-forces slammed them headfirst into the bottom of the overhead bins. Most of the crew and around 20 passengers were out of their seats carrying out their duties or, or going to the toilet. Um, and they were thrown against the ceiling with massive force. Um, luggage compartments burst open, spilling suitcases and backpacks into the aisles. Um, drinks, food, laptops, books, everything they tell you about, um, and other loose items flew in every direction. Back in the cockpit, Captain Sullivan reached for the side stick to pull the aircraft out of the dive, but when he tried to bring the nose up, there was no response. The automatic systems had locked him out. So he let go and tried again, and this time because the data spike was over, the elevators responded and he was able to bring the plane out of the dive. As the negative G-forces subsided though, everyone in the cabin who had been pinned to the ceiling now came crashing back down, hitting the floor, seats, and other passengers. Um, amongst the passengers themselves, there were broken bones, concussions, serious lacerations and more. All of the flight attendants were injured to, to various degrees. Um, one person broke a leg, um, several suffered serious spinal injuries, and many were bleeding profusely. Um, First Officer Lipset, who'd been making his way back to the cockpit, actually broke his nose. Um, now back in control though, Sullivan and Hayes, who were not hurt, um, were trying to clear all of these error messages from the computer screen and get the flight back on, on track. As they worked, um, the stall and overspeed warnings continued to blare. Um, Second Officer Hale made an announcement over the public address system calling for all passengers and crew to sit down and fasten their seatbelts immediately. Yeah. Um, suddenly another spike, bad spike though, of AOA data made it through to the flight computer. This time the dive wasn't as steep um, and most of the people had fastened their seatbelts, but for the people who were injured or the people helping them, um, they were thrown into the ceiling again. This time, just like the first time, Sullivan's initial efforts to pull back up um, had no effect. But the resistance stopped after a few seconds and he was able to level the plane out. <coughs> 
So with all kinds of alarms going on and off in the background and new error messages kind of constantly popping up, um, the crew were unsure of what was happening and feared that they could go into a dive again at any moment. So they decided to declare a mayday and diverted for an emergency landing to Learmouth in, or near Exmouth in WA. At this time, um, Sullivan noted that the automated stri uh, st trim stabilizer um, wasn't working and that trim would actually have to be adjusted manually. So this is using like a wheel to do it. Um, the navigation equipment was also not functioning and they couldn't interact with the computer interface at all. And so the pilots flew the remainder of the flight on full manual mode, trying to ignore the constant spurious alarms that refused to turn off. The sudden pitch downs never returned, and Flight 72 landed safely at Learmonth at 1.32 p.m. All told, 119 of the 315 passengers and crew were injured, 12 of them seriously. And the interior of the cabin was, was utterly trashed, and while the plane would fly again and no one was killed, and many people suffered injuries that will be with them for the rest of their lives. So investigators, investigators with the Australian Transportation Safety Board um, had to ask how could something like this happen. As it turned out though, um, this wasn't the first time this type of error had occurred. Another Qantas A330 had experienced a similar data problem in 2006, also off the coast of Western Australia. And in December of 2008, after this accident had occurred, um, it happened again on another Qantas flight, also off the coast of Western Australia. Um, luckily, neither of these two other cases involved an uncommanded pitch down, um, but the failure mode for the IRU in all three instances was similar. And two of them even involved the exact same IRU. So the fact that these failures had all occurred within a small geographical region um, seemed you know, kind of too strange to be a coincidence, but despite a variety of theories um, and a call from the Australian and the International Pilots Association to ban flights over the area totally, um, investigators couldn't really find anything inherent to Western Australia that could have caused the malfunctions. Um, there were suggestions that the Harold Holt Naval Communications Station, if you've ever been to Exmouth, you'll have seen this, and um, that this might have caused the issue, but the, the testing on the unit the actual unit itself, they submitted to low level radiation or radio frequencies um, and approved this to be highly unlikely. Um, in fact, the, the ATSB was never able to conclusively find what caused the IRU malfunction and uh, what, what caused it to send out the mislabeled data. And the only theory that they couldn't rule out 100% was what's called a single event effect or an SEE for short. Um, an SEE occurs when a high energy particle from outer space, like a, a cosmic ray or a neutrino, um, to be, a neutron to be more exact, um, strikes a chip and it, it randomly flips a bit from a one to a zero or a zero to a one. So the theory is that if an SEE occurred at a critical location within the IRU's GPU memory module, or CPU's memory module, um, it could just maybe have triggered everything that kind of followed on from there. But what made the failure of the IRU dangerous um, was not that it failed, per se, um, but that the um, invalid data passed through so many layers of cross-checks that they'd had, or that were in place, without being flagged as invalid. So the investigators found a previously kind of unknown failure mode in which data spikes occurring at approximately 1.2 seconds could trick the computer into thinking that the data was valid. And this was where the real kind of safety problem lay. You know, it might not be possible to stop a, a few ones and zeros from becoming corrupted every now and then, um, but if the layer protections that are in place couldn't identify that corrupted data, that represented what the real security risk was. But the protections that were in place on the um, IRU itself um, were pretty good. They could weed out 93.5% of invalid data on its own with its own checks before even passing it to the computer, which did its own cross-checking again. Um, obviously, this wasn't enough to prevent the in injury of like 119 people, um, but in principle, the IRU remained completely safe. Um, this type of failure only occurred three times in 128 million hours of service for this module, um, well within the probability zone of what regulators consider to be extremely remote. In its final report, um, the ATSB wrote that the investigation was extremely difficult and touched on numerous areas where no accident investigation had ventured before. The authors of the report were also keenly aware that that Qantas Flight 72 incident um, could be representative of the sort of case that would become more common in the modern automated era. Um, just days after the accident, Airbus issued a bulletin to all A330 operators instructing pilots to immediately shut off the indicated IRU when receiving a fault. 
Um, this advice might have actually been what, what, um, <clears throat> what prevented a similar accident in the Qantas flight later in December of that year. Um, those pilots in, on that Flight 71, they experienced the same thing, but turned it off within about 28 seconds. Um, Airbus also redesigned the logic used by the flight computer to verify angle of attack data, um, removing the possibility that a well-timed spike like that could cause the same kind of incident again. Um, furthermore, Airbus has also introduced novel ways of testing its data verification software, including testing with intermittent data spikes, which had not previously been attempted. Um, so safety agencies are, are still researching the best ways to approach this kind of problem, and our understanding of the safety implications of it are still developing. Nevertheless, though, I think Qantas Flight 72 stands out as the, the, the first case where investigators delve deeply into a software failure and um, hopefully uh, serves as a reminder of the importance of keeping your seatbelt fastened at all times. Awesome. So there's a lot, obviously, I think we, we could take out of this in that it was a kind of a software problem. Um, but what I really want to highlight is how risk and the understanding of risk allows commercial airlines to operate in at the safety kind of standards that they do. And it's something that we're, we're definitely getting better at as an industry, particularly you know, in kind of larger companies who can afford to invest into that. Um, but it's something like, that I rarely see discussed at the, at, in enterprise IT projects. And there's actually quite a lot of data and analysis out there that can help us to do this. So in general, um, project performance has been improving globally. In 2021, um, nearly 70% of projects met their original goals or business intent while 60% were completed within the original budget. Um, but IT projects, as we all know, are in, in inherently dif are notoriously difficult to manage. Um, a survey published by the Harvard Business Review found that the average IT project overran its budget by 27%. Um, moreover, at least one in six IT projects turns into a black swan where, uh, with a cost overrun of at least 200% and a schedule overrun of 70%. And failure rate corresponds heavily to the project size. So a project with a budget of over $1 million is 50% more likely to fail than a project with a budget of under $350,000. A PwC study of over 10,000 projects found that only 2.5% of companies complete their projects 100% successfully. And I'd argue that those 2.5% are liars. <laughs> um, Overall, these failures cost uh, between 50 to 150 billion of lost revenue and productivity every year. And last one, 17% of IT projects can go so bad that they can threaten the very existence of a company. But I've never heard anyone or any project even consider that as a remote possibility for what they're doing. Is what we're building something that could destroy our whole company? But it should be. So one thing I hear a lot from people um, when I bring this up is that it's hard or it's impossible to quantify certain types of risk. Um, and that's not true. If you, can kind of, if you understand something, you can model it. Um, even if just, that just means that you can put a realistic range on it, that's a much better answer than I don't know what it is. Um, and there's a whole bunch of tools out there that can help you. So if you want to measure anything, there is a very useful book called How to Measure Anything. Um, that will help you measure intangible things like the cost of security breaches or brand damage. And a mistake that I see uh, a lot of people making is when they start to look at risk is that they use averages. And um, averages aren't great for understanding risk and you, you should really be using things like sampling, ranges and models to assess these things instead. Um, the flaw of averages explains this complex area really well and is a great layperson's introduction to statistics and risk. It helped me to understand it. Um, and the work of Troy McGuinness and Focused Objective in Seattle, um, they provide free to use spreadsheets to help you get started with this in your software development projects um, specifically. Um, Troy is originally from Australia um, and he runs awesome training courses when he comes back every now and again. So if you do get the chance to go, I'd highly recommend it. Sign up for his newsletter too. Um, so what I hope you kind of take from this is, all of this really, is that the rules and regulations for, for airline safety are unfortunately written in blood. Um, for most of us, we don't have that same pressure. I think ours are, are written in either our own sweat or in the frustrated kind of tears of our users. Um, but as a profession, you know, we can look to what others have done um, and apply what they've learned the hard way to make our customers and our own lives better. So that's all I've got for you today. Um, I hope you've learned something that you can take back from your teams and maybe feel a little bit safer about flying. No? Um, if you're keen to read more about air crashes, um, I'll post a link in the conference Slack to, to, to this and all my other resources. Um, but the work of Admiral Cloudberg, who 
those write-ups on air crashes, they are absolutely amazing and they're the source of the, the, the stories that I've told you today. Um, or just hit me up, there's my contact details on the bottom. But um, that's it, um, thank you for your time. Enjoy the last day of the conference. <laughs> and safe travels. <laughs> Cheers.